It is my pleasure to um, chair this first session uh, on um, when emotions become collective, which um, the best way to do that is to have a philosopher to introduce the topic. Uh, so I'm pleased to welcome uh, Miko Salmela um, as our first speaker. Miko is a fellow at the Center of Excellence uh, in the Philosophy of Social Sciences at the University of Helsinki. He's working on individual emotions and their relation to collective emotions. He's the co-editor with Chris Van Schief, who's also somewhere in this room, uh, of, oh, he will be tomorrow, uh, of, a, of an excellent volume, um, collective volume on uh, collective emotions, so this is perfectly fitting, and also he has written a number of papers on these issues, so please. Okay, okay. good morning everyone. Thank you, Julie. Gilam, Elisabeth, uh, Gedi, everyone who has been involved in the organization of this conference. I'm very pleased and proud to be here. And uh, my talk is titled, What are Collective Emotions? And I will present some philosophical and more broadly theoretical perspectives on what collective emotions are. And uh, in my aspect, I point out that uh, empirical researchers have been eager to study the antecedents and consequences of collective motions, but there has not been so much theorizing on what collective motions really are. So this kind of work has been done or been left to philosophers to attend to. So that's what I hope to cover in this talk. Oops. So theories of collective motions. There is obviously historical background to them, and the crowd theories that were mentioned already in the introduction are this historically mostly known background. And ever since the similar works of Le Bon and Durkheim, researchers in the social and behavioral sciences have been intrigued by collective emotional phenomena. The first upsurge in theorizing about collective emotions occurred in the now infamous, or at the time famous, crowd theory, whose main protagonist was Le Bon. Interest in crowd behavior had emerged after the French Revolution that convinced historians about the inherent corruption of the human nature, especially when people form and act in crowds. Le Bon tried to bring together all the work that had been done on the crowd since 1870. Le Bon and later after him, MacDougall and Freud argued that the rapid and non-conscious spreading of emotions in crowds undermines individual rational thought and automatically aligns the behaviors of individuals gathered in crowds. Le Bon thought that emotions and behaviors in crowds are contagious and constitutive of inherently irrational group mind that emerges in a crowd. Totalitarian political ideologies and movements that gained power in several European countries in the 1930s were influenced by the crowd theory and they realized the worst fears of crowd theorists about the destructive and irrational nature of emotionally motivated collective action. Well, fortunately, uh, before that even, Emil Durkheim had already put forward a more positive view on collective emotions. He introduced the notion of collective effer effervescence as a sort of electricity that is generated when people gather together in mass meetings and religious rituals. Importantly, Durkheim was one of the first scholars to emphasize the positive social functions of collective emotions. In his view, collective emotions experienced in rituals imbue a community with affective solidarity, as well as with socially shared beliefs and values with affective meanings that are salient beyond the immediate ritual context. Durkheim's influence on later research on collective emotions, especially social sciences, has been tremendous. Yet theoretically, Durkheim, as well as the ritualistic tradition of sociology after him, that has focused on the preconditions of condition, consequences of collective emotions, has not paid much attention to the specific nature of these emotions, what they really are. And when we look at the theorizing on the nature of collective emotions, there is a rich phenomenological tradition, uh, starting from Max Scheler and after him, Edith Stein. Max Scheler, in his book, Wesen und Formen der Sympathie, analyzes several forms of emotional sharing. 
And one of them is uh, what he calls Mitainanda Fulen, translated in English as immediate feeling together. Scheller's example are parents who are mourning the death of their child. Scheller denies that emotional sharing can be understood as individual experience plus reciprocal knowledge of these emotions. Instead of individual token emotions of the same type, Scheller suggests that the parents participate in the same token emotion, that is the same grief. They participate in the same emotion of grief instead of having individual grief about the death of the child. This paradoxical proposal has inspired contemporary phenomenologists who debate on whether sharing of emotions involves the fusion of self and other into a plural subject or whether there can be some sense of plurality even without a fusion in experience. Edith Stein is another phenomenologist involved in this debate. In her philosophy of so psychology and the humanities from 1922, obviously in German, the original, proposed another early phenomenological account of emotional sharing and collective emotions, as Thomas Santo has pointed out in his recent analysis of Stein's theory. Stein's account of emotional sharing is embedded in her general theory of communal experiences, uh, and her paradigmatic examples are collective emotions, such as collective grieving of a group member. The plural subject of a collective emotion is a plurality of subjects or social integrate, and as such, a as is a part of shared experience, not some supra-individual entity, entity over and above individuals. Shared emotions involve a specific mode of being shared and a part of a communal experience. Okay, if this is the historical background, then we can look at the more recent theorizing. And as we can see, this research has really boomed in recent years. Most of these contributions are from this decade. Margaret Gilbert's and Bennett Helms are from the last decade, but my work and most phenomenological research has been done in the quite recent years. Analytic approaches involve Margaret Gilbert's, in this context pretty early, plural subject view, Bennett Helms theorizing on plural agency, and my own typology of collective emotions that I categorize as broadly analytic, even if I draw from phenomenological sources as well. Phenomenological approaches include Mitt Schmidt's, hans Berhard Schmidt's plural subject view, and then there are some recent uh, writings on, by Jan Slabi and Giovanna Colombetti and Joel Kruger on the scaffolding of emotions. I think this is interesting as such, but I don't see the connection between collective emotions to, so much because they talk about the scaffolding of individual emotions so that we, for instance, use portable devices to listen to music, and we go to concerts and theaters and, and cinema to uh, kind of elicit certain emotions, and in that way, regulate our emotions through uh, material scaffoldings and, and interpersonal scaffoldings in the environment. I think this is important for the elicitation of emotions, but it doesn't so much contribute to the analysis of what collective emotions really are. Then we have Santos Sanyan account and uh, Dan Zahavi's uh, phenomenological account that draws from his work on, on empathy and emotional sharing in that context. And finally, in that tradition, we have uh, Sanchez Guerrero's forthcoming feeling together view. This is a forthcoming book from Springer that I won't discuss because it's a forthcoming work. But in, in any case, that emphasizes this kind of feeling of togetherness, which is part of emotional experiences when they are shared and felt together. And finally, we have uh, Bryce Hibner's distributed emotion view. And I will say something on each of them and then finally present my own account in the last. I don't see uh, time anywhere here, so how I'm doing with time? It's open for about 10 minutes, perhaps 30 more minutes. Okay, good, good to know. So, Margaret Gilbert has two views on collective emotions. The first one, what she calls membership emotion, and that is an aggregative view, because there are individual emotions aggregated. And that is, for instance, guilt over... Okay. Thanks. Yeah. For instance, guilt is over what one's group has done on the basis of a joint commitment. 
still it's aggregately individual emotions that are being felt in this context. People are feeling emotions as members of their groups. And this is something that has been done in social psychology and sociology. This is a group-based emotion view, basically, studied in, in those disciplines. But Gilbert proposes that there is an other way of talking about collective emotions, and this is what she calls plural subject view. And her definition for guilt in that context is, for instance, for us collectively to feel guilt over our action A is for us to be jointly committed to feeling guilt as a body over our action A. So she thinks that there is some kind of joint commitment, collective commitment, underlying all collectively intentional attitudes, whether they are beliefs, they are intentions, they all involve this joint commitment. And she extends this view to emotions, or as she calls feelings as well. It can be very implicit. It need not be any kind of declaration that now we all commit ourselves to feeling, for instance, grief in this situation. But some kind of understanding that spreads among the participants that well, we are collectively committed to this feeling, and that in then is expressed by acting and taking, talking in ways that are consistent with the emotion. For instance, when we are committed jointly to grief, we are committed to uh, have a, this kind of somber outlook and, and speaking in silent voice and so forth. Feelings are not essential for Gilbert. She thinks that emotions are evaluative judgments. This is this kind of old stoic or uh, Martha Nussbaum's or Rob, Robert Solomon's early views are, are influenced by the stoic and, uh, idea that emotions are about judgments and feelings are just con contingent part of them. And I think that there is a legitimate use for this kind of view, namely political uh, context in which, for instance, apologies by governments to uh, indigenous people like the Australian government's uh, apology to the aboriginals and their treatment in the country was kind of collectively jointly committed expression of, of, of guilt. But I don't think that this is a very typical way of co experiencing collective emotion. I mean, no genuine collective emotions can be experienced without feelings, as several philosophers have pointed out. And no genuine emotion can be established by joint commitment. I mean, there is, in sociology, this ninth uh, notion of emotion norm introduced by Ali Hochschild. And uh, I could say that we can establish an emotion norm by collecting ourselves, collectively committing ourselves by thinking that some emotion is appropriate in the situation. But it is another thing to commit ourselves to a norm and then actually to feel the emotion that we think to be normative in the situation. So this membership guilt fares better than plural subject account in her view, I think. Uh, another analytic approach is by Bennett Helm. He thinks that emotions are felt evaluations that together with the subject's other evaluative attitudes constitute a rational pattern of import. So this idea is that emotions come as patterns. For instance, when I'm afraid of a uh, kind of valuable Ming vase, that is his example, Ming vase being destroyed by a ball thrown by a neighbor kid, then I'm also committed to hoping that this base survives unscathed from this event. I'm committed to feeling angry at the neighbor kid who threw the ball, and so forth. These emotions come in patterns with the shared common focus to them. And if emotions and evaluative judgments are part of the same pattern of rationality, and these individual items, emotions and evaluative judgments, are branded by virtue of there being elements of this projectable pattern of rationality. So this can be extended to the group context by saying that there is a collective import that is constituted by the projectable pattern of rationality in the group members' responses. So that the group members feel the same emotions when some object of their concern is affected favorably or adversely in the situation. For instance, when group members are painting a house together, they are committed to uh, exhibit a pattern of hope, fear, frustration, anticipation, dissipation, joy, relief, and so forth at the appropriate times and for the right reasons. 
because we, the group, feel that the import that the house for us, uh, the house has for, for, for us, not for personal reasons alone. Uh, the problems of this count seem to be related to its scope of application. I mean, his primary example is a group of friends or a couple of friends, two friends who are going to have a lunch at, at, uh, on a beach and uh, whether their kind of responses are similar to each other when something happens to their plan. And another context that might be relevant are small groups that have intimate and vivid collaboration between the members. But unfortunately, there are no means to adjudicate conflicts between emotions and evaluative judgments within this pattern of rationality, either individual or collective, or with different group members' divergent responses. Helm points out that uh, these responses of individual members ought to align such that uh, where your responsiveness to change then other things being evil, mine ought to change as well. But this has little to help in this kind of question, whether it's my responses that should change or the other person's. So it just notes the problem without addressing it. Okay, then over to phenomenological approaches. And first, Schmidt. His account of emotions is drawn from Bennett Helm. And the original idea is this phenomenological fusion that he draws from Scheler. Scheller's idea of this sharing emotion as having the same token emotion shared by the participants. And his idea is this phenomenological fusion that is possible to interpret one's feelings or emotions either as my states, which is the typical way, or as our states. And this is kind of pre-reflective, unthematic understanding or interpretation of one's emotional experience. It underlies shared concerns of some kind, but it happens during the phenomenological experience. And his example is the joy at the successful first performance of a symphony in which the composer who is present feels uh, exuberant joy. Uh, the members of the orchestra, orchestra, the musicians are also participating in the joy. Stage manager even is feeling content with things, how things are going. And so they all part of this we that emerges in this experience. And differences in the intensity and quality of feeling don't threaten the emergence of phenomenological we, according to Schmidt. And he also has this new formulation of what, what's going on. He says that there's plural pre-reflective self-awareness of shared emotional concerns in this phenomenological fusion taking place. Now the problems seem to be that a phenomenological fusion of feelings is neither sufficient no necessary for sharing emotions. And this first worry why it's not sufficient relates to, that, to the thing that it seems to be possible to experience this fusion in very different contexts, like the symphony uh, performance context and this, this grieving parents context. Because in the symphony context, the, the participants can have very different kinds of concerns. I mean, the, the musicians definitely have are concerned about giving excellent performance, and uh, composer likewise. But uh, the stage manager probably doesn't have concerns that relate to the quality of the experience, uh, performance, so much that, that everything goes otherwise well. So if this is an example of phenomenological fusion, then it's very different from this grieving parents case, because they definitely have very strongly shared concerns about the wealth, uh, the health, and uh, the survival of their child who hasn't survived. So this is, these are very different cases, and I, therefore, they shouldn't be taken as similar. And neither it's, it's necessary, because it seems that this uh, phenomenolo phenomenological experience of emotions can be focused on the object of emotion, us feeling it together, or whatever. On our bodily, bodily state, we can focus on our agitation, in feeling emotion, so it, it doesn't be focused on this kind of togetherness in, ex, in, in the experience. And this is something that uh, uh, Lambie and Marcel point out in their 2002 paper on emotional phenomenology, phenomenology of emotional experience, that emotional experience can be world-focused, it can be self-focused, or it can be body-focused, and 
there are different ways in the experience of emotions. And problem with the new formulation is that concerns seem to underlie emotions rather than being considerate about their experience. When I'm feeling fear, I'm not experiencing the concern for my health, for instance. I'm not experiencing the concern for my survival. I'm experiencing feeling towards something that is the object that threatens my survival. Uh, now, I, again, I have to ask for the time how I'm doing. Ten more, Ten more minutes. Okay, I have to run. Dan Zahavi's main question is, does sharing emotional experiences presuppose, precede, or preserve, or abolish the difference between self and other experience? And main claim is against Schmid. Sharing has nothing to do with the fusion, nor with the merged uh, unity. So there is sharing, but there is also kind of awareness of there being difference in the experience. He argues that shared emotional experiences are constitutively interdependent and co-regulated, and there is reciprocal awareness of their being shared, not something that is fused into kind of single experience. And this feeling of togetherness is important for this, this sharing as well. And he refers to Alfred Schutz's idea that there are interlocked individual streams of consciousness colored by the participants' mutual involvement. And there is second portion perspective taking, some kind of identification with another person or identification with a group underlying this kind of feeling of togetherness. Again, I think this is a nice analysis. We, there's lot, lot, much to learn from this, but it seems also to limit to diads and, and small groups. For instance, what grounds group identification in larger co groups? Uh, Zahavi briefly refers to my idea that there are shared concerns or shared values underlying this group identification, but he don't think that it's, it's important or necessary at least. And I think that it is necessary when we talk about these kind of larger groups where there is no direct communication, there is no possibility for direct interdependent or co-regulation of emotions going on. And there are different kinds of group identification as well, in my view. Okay, and the final uh, other account is the computational account by Bryce Hübner. And this analogy is from distributed cognition. And he claims that it's possible to kind of analyze emo collective emotions as distributed emotions in the same way as distributed cognition has been analyzed. So the idea is that collective emotions are coordinated at integrated states of complex computational systems whose subsystems realize distinct components of emotion. And analogy is distributed compu computation in individual emotions where different parts of the organism are functioning in different roles and therefore it's possible to, to extend this, this to collective case. And he dis discusses at length this uh, Edwin Hutchins example of USS Palau, where we can find this kind of detection and response to danger by distributed efforts of the crew. And the problem with this case, according to Hübner, is that there seems to be no affective quality to this thing, even if it seems like a case of fear, because there is danger involved, or there is response of a response to this danger, an adaptive one. And then he finds, uh, proposes a more emotional case, the mccain palin presidential campaign near the ag election day 2008, in which he claims that there was some kind of agitation involved in the whole campaign, but different members of the campaign were functioning in different roles and uh, different components of emotion were uh, thereby attributed to different parts of the, the, the campaign crew. But as we now know better through an excellent uh, TV movie, The Game Change uh, from 2012, it seemed to be the case that uh, in the hectic days of McKellen Payne campaign, when it was drawing towards the end, several key members were not only agitated, but clearly afraid of losing the election. So they shared more robustly this kind of fear of losing and therefore we cannot distribute this emotion so neatly to different members of the crew. Okay, finally, finally I have nicely played out myself from this <laughs> theoretical game. 
But uh, my proposal that has been put forward in 2012 paper, Shared Emotions, and afterwards uh, 2014 paper, function of some Functions of Collective Emotions in Social Groups, and most recently in my joint papers with uh, Michiru Nagatsu, is that we can distinguish two main aspects in emotion. That is affective experience and evaluative content. And those are shared when we share our emotions. And we are mutually aware of sharing these two main parts of emotion. And phenomenologically, the evaluative content of affective experience are typically intertwined and intentionally directed at the particular object of emotion. So emotional experience is not something in which we can distinguish them, but we can analogically draw them apart. Evaluative content, affective experience, even if in the experience they are more or less merged always. We have a kind of feeling to, towards, as Peter, the late Peter Coley, Goldie used to say, that emotions are feel, felt towards objects, and therefore affectivity penetrates the intentionality of emotions always, more or less. But still, I think that involuntary content of emotion is necessarily intentional, and affective experience is only contingently so. Why? Well, because this affective experience can be body-focused, not only focused at the intentional object of emotion. And because there is this possibility of it's being body-focused, it's only contingently intentional. Evaluative content I have analyzed in terms of shared concerns that underlie collective emotions, I distinguish between three kinds of shared concerns, overlapping private concerns, moderately collective concerns, and strongly collective concerns. And these uh, correspond to what the Finnish philosopher of social sciences, uh, or more recently social ontology, Raimo Tuomela has called plain I mode, weak we mode, and strong we mode. An example of private concern is kind of my concern more for my health or my wealth. And typically, for instance, shareholders concern for the, uh, how, how their shares are, are faring in, in the share market is this kind of private concern. And they are feeling afraid when the uh, prices, uh, stock prices go down. This is kind of shared in a very uh, weak sense of sharing. Then we have uh, moderately collective concerns, for instance, when I identify my, myself as a, a fan of certain football team, like Paris Saint-Germain or Liverpool FC or Dortmund, uh, whatever. And this is kind of my private identification with certain group that is weak, we mode. But when I'm part of the group, for instance, when I'm a member of the Paris Saint-Germain squad or Liverpool squad, team member, then this becomes this strong collective commitment, and there are collective con concerns in the strongest sense. And these shared concerns provide both motivating and justifying reasons for the emergence of collective emotions when individuals perceive that their shared concerns are affected either adversely or favorably. This is Bennett Helm's idea, but also pointed out by social psychologists Parkinson, Fisher, and Manstead in their book, Emotion Relation Emotions in Social Relations. So, there is normative side to it, and there is empirical side to this. That this seems to be the case. When people share concerns, then they provide them both motivating and justifying reasons for the emergence of these shared emotions. And the affective experience, I think it emerges from this kind of wide-ranging synchrony that is part that is present when, when there is when the participants are physically co-present with each other, it affects various aspects of individual emotional responses, physiological changes, facial expressions, action tendencies, and subjective feelings. And there is an ample, there's a lot of uh, empirical research on these processes that contribute to the synchronization. And I'm sure that we will hear much more on these processes by, by other contributors of this, this symposium. So I just mentioned that they concern attentional deployment, emotional contagion, facial mimicry, motor mimicry, and imitation neural mirroring and social references. They contribute all to this wide-ranging synchronization of emotional exp exp experiences. And this is my ideal typology of collective emotions. So I think that there are weakly collective, moderately collective, strongly collective emotions because both main dimensions of emotion, evaluative content and affective experience, allow for a continuum 
in their sharing. It's not an on-off thing. It's, it's, there are variations. There are degrees of collectivity. And these weekly collective emotions are the case in which these stockholders are just individually worried about the stock prices and kind of panic when there is a meltdown in the stock market. A synchronization of active, affective responses is when we look at the dimension low, high, narrow, wide, it's, it's more to this low thing. And narrow thing, why? Well, we know from social psychological research that uh, facial behavioral motor mimicry is affected by group membership so that when people are not part of the same group, they don't mimic so much as when they are part of the same group. And therefore, when there is, in this case, there is typically no group membership, the synchronization is towards this low dimension. And it's also narrow because there is no shared intentional object in the motion because it's individual fear about my, con my wealth that is at, at stake. That is different in moderately collective motions because there is group membership. It is in the dimension of low heights towards this high thing. And it's also wide because there is intentionality involved, shared intentionality towards the same thing the motion is felt. And the strongest case where synchronization is high and wide is the, the strongly collective case when people are collectively committed members of the group. These are partly hypothetical, these views that about synchronization and its uh, intensity or extensity, but, but I think that they are based on uh, empirical evidence anyway. And this is, the this is the last slide. So I argue that uh, different types of collective motions have subtly different roles in social groups. So that when we know from social sci psychological and sociological research that collective motions contribute to the emergence, maintenance, and integration of social groups. But different types of collective motions function in subtly different ways and in different degrees. So that weekly collective motions only contingently contribute to the emergence and maintenance of social groups. For instance, weekly collective anger about layoffs. When workers are being laid off from a company, they re realize that they have different, they have shared interests and they may even establish a trade union to, uh, uh, as their representative against, uh, in, in the negotiations with the em employer. But for instance, it's only contingently beneficial for the group when people mod uh, act on their shared emotion, this kind of weekly collective emotion. Angry workers may find benefit by, by acting on their joint anger, but panicked shareholders act against, the interest, against their collective interests when they rush to sell their stocks. That uh, hurts them all, so it's only contingently beneficial. Whereas in the strong, uh, strongly and moderately collective emotions, they maintain and reinforce more robust and resilient solidarity and group identification than weekly collective emotions and they pro provide motivating and justifying reasons for joint action that is by default beneficial for the group by virtue of underlying shared concerns. That is from the group perspective, it is beneficial for the group members because they share these concerns in a more robust sense than in, in the weekly collective case. And they smoothen coordination of joint action. The more collective motion, the more intensive and extensive is the synchrony and thereby this kind of facilitation of joint action as well. And if you're interested in, in philosophy of joint action, I recommend this paper of uh, Collective Emotions and Joint Action, quite recent, written by my, myself and Michiro Nagatsu. It's open access paper, so it's available for everyone. That's it. Thank you. <laughs>